طيب ان شاء الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا إنك على كل شيء قدير السلام عليكم الحمد لله hope you're all in good health and iman إن شاء الله Today's topic that we're going to take is a very important topic and it's something that most people have questions about when they come to traveling. So the chapter the author he says Al-Hajjawi rahimahullah ta'ala Faslun fi qasal musafir lis-salah The chapter or the section pertaining to the shortening of the traveler of the prayer. So he's going to talk here issues pertaining to shortening. There is another section uh, which goes along with this uh, the traveler's prayer which is joining we'll leave that to another time inshallah because there's quite a few masai there's quite a few issues in this particular section and i think that will be enough to uh, keep us busy for a week or so with revision and understanding so we'll stick to what he says here today he's going to speak about shortening and issues pertaining to that when one is traveling so the author he says man safara Whoever travels, okay, he means that whoever travels, then this person can then shorten. Many of the explainers of this book, uh, Zad al Mustaqna, like Imam Bahuti, Rahimullah Ta'ala, in his Rod al Murbi' and others, they say rather what is supposed to have been said here, what is meant, is man nawa, whoever intends to travel. Why? They say because somebody could be in a situation whereby they're lost in an open land or they've lost something. And so they end up walking for hours and hours. They could end up walking the distance of traveling, but they didn't intend to be a traveler. Therefore, this person cannot avail the ruqsa, the permissions of joining the salah or shortening the salah, because the person didn't intend to be a traveler. It just happened that they traversed the land uh, over a certain amount of time and uh, over a certain uh, amount of kilometers. So without the intention, the person doesn't shorten. And this is correct. The author, he says, Safran Mubahan, that the journey in order for a person to be able to take the ruqsa, to take the permission of shortening, it has to be that which is permissible. It has to be a journey which is not full of sin or uh, of a sinful intent, right? It can't have a sinful haram objective or a, or a makru objective. So early question to yourselves, why do you think this is a condition that in order for a person to be able to take the ruqsa, the permission of uh, shortening and joining, then the travel that they are on should not be one of sinful intent, of sinful purpose. Why is this a condition? Question to yourselves. So the ulama, they say, as a rule, a ruqas la tustabahu bil ma'asi. A ruqas la tustabahu bil ma'asi. That the permissions like shortening and joining are uh, not given based upon sin because that would mean that then you are helping someone to commit their sin so the sharia doesn't help anybody to commit a sin and we find this further explained in surah al-baqarah where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said inna harrama alaykum al-maytata wal-damma wal-lahm al-khinziri wa ma uhilla bihi li ghayri allah fa man itturra ghayra baghi wa la adin fa la ithma alayhi inna allah ghafur rahim so in this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that verily what has been made haram upon you is dead meat and blood, okay, and the meat of the swine and that which has been sacrificed for other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah goes on to say, however, if somebody is in a state of necessity, he's in a state of necessity without evil intent, meaning he's not doing this haram action on purpose, he's in a state of necessity, then in this situation, فَلَا إِثْمَ عَلَيْهِ Then there's no sin upon the person to go ahead and eat the dead meat or eat the swine meat or drink the blood uh, due to having to save their own lives. So this ruqsa, which Allah mentions in this verse in Surah Al-Baqarah, it's in a situation where a person is near death, okay? A person is in a situation of being, you know, close to death and they need to eat from the swine or they need to eat from the dead flesh. So the ulama, they say that if this, in this dire situation is not allowed except with that which is a rightful intention, then any rukhsa, any permission which is less than that is from Bab al-Awla, is more so not allowed. So the person who intends to go on a journey and to use that journey for sinful purposes, then the ulama, they say that this is not allowed for a person to uh, take the rukhsa of shortening or joining in this particular journey. 
However, from the Hanbali scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Aqil, they held that even in a safar, excuse me, even in a journey, which is uh, going to be for unlawful purposes, then the person can take benefit of the rukhsa of joining the salawat or shortening the salawat. And they took this from the verse in Surah An-Nisa where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَإِذَا دَرَبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاهٌ أَنْ تَقْصَرُوا مِنَ الصَّلَاةِ that if you go upon the earth in a journey, then there's no sin upon you to shorten your prayers. So they say that the verse is غير, is mutlaq, غير مقيد بالحال. That it's an open, unrestricted verse, and it's not restricted due to a situation. Meaning that Allah in this verse where he allowed the people to shorten the prayer, he didn't give situations that, as an exception, that if you were to go on this journey for a sinful purpose, then it would mean that you cannot take the ruqsa, rather Allah left the verse mutlaq, left it open in general without any restrictions. Question to yourselves, what if a person is on a journey with mixed intentions? So we said that for example, if the journey has haram intention, the person is going to do haram on the journey, okay, then it's impermissible for the person to do the joining of the salawat or the joining of the salawat. However, what is the situation with regards to somebody who has mixed intentions? Part of his journey is going to be for that which is permissible and part of the journey is going to be for that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the situation here? What is the ruling here? Question to yourselves. Barakallah fiqh. I'll give you good inshallah. So again, the question was that if somebody undertakes a journey and in the journey, they're going to have mixed intentions, right? So what you have to look at here is that what is the majority of the journey consisting of? So if the majority of the journey is consisting of that which is khayb, that which is good, then the person is allowed to do the rukhsa. But if the majority of the journey is going to consist of that which is haram and ill intent, then the person cannot take the rukhsa because the ulama, they say, al akthar ya'khud hukm al-kul, that the majority takes the ruling of the whole. So if the majority of the act of worship, meaning the journey, is going to be of ill intent, of haram actions, then the person cannot do the rukhsa, it's not accepted for him to uh, shorten the prayers. However, if the majority of the journey was for good and only some of it was for evil, may Allah protect us, then his prayers in a joined or in a shortened format would be accepted. And that was mentioned by Shaykh Abdul Salam al-Shawair, Hafizahullah and Allah knows best. Tayyib, the author he says, Arba'ata burd. What he's mentioning here is the distance, what should consist of the distance of a journey wherein a person is allowed to take the ruqsa of joining the salah or of shortening the salah or of both. So he says, Arba'at al burd. So a burid, okay, four burid, which he says here, four burd, is a journey of two days or more on camel or foot. A journey of two days or more on camel or foot. And four burid in terms of distance is mentioned as 16 farsakh. 16 farsakh. And one farsakh is three miles. So in total, that would equate to around 80 kilometers, okay? So the length of a journey has to be around 80 kilometers in order for a person to avail himself of the ruqsa of shortening the salawat. And this is because in the hadith uh, in Bukhari, uh, which is mu'allaq, uh, okay? In the hadith of Bukhari, the, uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu mentioned that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa would shorten his, uh, would shorten based upon this distance. So they say that anything outside or under this distance goes back to the asal, which is that the person should complete the salah. So they base it upon the statement of Ibn Abbas in Bukhari, that the Prophet Sallallahu and others from amongst the companions like Ibn Umar, they would shorten upon the distance of around 80 kilometers. And anything below that would go back to the asal, which is that the person has to complete. Uh, Ibn Qudam and Ibn Taymiyyah has a second opinion in the Madhab that they say there is no set distance uh, for the journey. That which the people consider as a journey, then that is considered as a journey, as traveling. And that which they consider not to be traveling is not considered as traveling. What they mean here is that the Sharia, that is no explicit mention in the Quran or no explicit mention from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as to what defines a journey, as to what is the length of a journey. So this is their opinion that any journey that is customarily understood to be a journey, then that is taken wherein a person can shorten his salah. 
And as we said, the opinion of the Hanbali scholars overwhelmingly, the madhab opinion is that it has to be 80 kilometers or more. طيب, here's a mas'ala, and as we said, the word mas'ala means something which is questioned and something which is asked about often. The mas'ala is that uh, in the opinion of the madhab, the overwhelming uh, majority of the Hanbali scholars, they say that if a person is unsure as to what is the distance to a particular land that he wants to traverse, he wants to take a journey and reach a particular place, but he's not sure of what the distance is, whether it's 80 kilometers or less. They say the person on this journey is not allowed to make qasr, he's not allowed to uh, shorten the prayers, unless and until he knows for sure that to get to that land, it will be around 80 kilometers. Because due to the fact that the person is unsure of what the distance is, then he's not allowed to shorten. It's only when he knows for sure that this journey is around 80 kilometers or more, then the person can shorten. So the author, he says, may Allah have mercy upon him. The author, he says, Sunnah lahu qasr raka'atayn. It's recommended, it's sunnah for the person that they make the four raka'at into two. As we mentioned, the uh, verse in Surah An-Nisa where Allah says, وَإِذَا ضَرَبْتُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَقْصَرُوا مِنَ الصُّعَى That if you traverse the earth, then there's no uh, sin upon you to shorten the prayers. So in this verse, Allah, Allah said that it's a ruqsa, it's something which is permissible. That the person, when they undertake a journey, then they can shorten the, uh, the prayers. Uh, so it's not something which is wajib, but a question to yourselves would be, we're saying that it's sunnah, but what is better? Is it, though it's sunnah and it's not wajib, is it better for the person to shorten or is it better for the person to complete uh, as four rakah rather than as two rakah? So question to yourselves, what, what is a better situation? Is it better to shorten or is it better to complete? Because we're saying that it's recommended, it's not something which is wajib that you have to shorten. Question to yourselves. So yes, Barakallah so Fiqh. Yes. On that, on that basis, uh, just a clarification that what they mean here by Sunnah, they mean that it's something which is recommended and allowed, but it's not something which the Prophet instructed us to do as a Sunnah. So there's a slight difference in the termino terminology that they're using here, but may Allah reward you, very pertinent point that you mentioned. So the ulama and the Hanbali scholars, they said uh, in the Hanbali Madhab, they said that it's better for the person to shorten the salah, okay, even though it's not wajib, it's better to shorten because in Bukhari, it's mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, he never did other than that, meaning that the Prophet وسلم, would always shorten his prayer because Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, Sahibtu Rasulullah sallallahu fi safar, falam yazid ala rak'atayn hatta qabadahu Allah ta'ala. He said that I accompanied the Prophet وسلم, in a journey and the Prophet وسلم, always continued to shorten until Allah Azza wa Jal took his soul. And then he also, in the same narration in Bukhari, he said that, Sahibtu uh, Abu Bakrin, falam yazid ala raqatayn hatta qabdahullah. And likewise, I used to accompany Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr uh, radiallahu anhu, on a journey, and he would always do uh, two raka'ah until Allah Azza wa Jal took his soul. And then he mentioned the same with Umar, and he mentioned the same with Uthman. Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So it's something which is uh, firmly established that the person it's recommended for them and it's better for them to shorten the prayer on a journey and Allah knows best. Okay, uh, there's another riwayah in the madhab of Imam Ahmed which is that if somebody chose not to shorten then this will be that which is makru, that is disliked. Okay, it would be disliked. And this is held by Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Muflih and also by uh, Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala. But we said, the author said that it's sunnah for a person to shorter. And the second opinion of the mother is that it's disliked if a person did not shorten in a journey. Tayyib, with regards to shortening Maghrib and Fajr, this is something which is not allowed because the hadith in Ahmad said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِلَّا الْمَغْرِبْ فَإِنَّهَا وُتْرُ النَّهَارِ وَإِلَّا الصُبْحِ فَإِنَّهَا تَطُولُ فِيهَا الْقِرَاءَةِ That except for Maghrib, you cannot shorten in Maghrib because it is the witr of the day. Okay, and also in the Subh, the Fajr, you cannot shorten in the Fajr because the recitation in the Fajr is a long recitation. This hadith is in, uh, collected by Imam Ahmad 
and also Imam Ibn Mundhir and others, they said there is ijma consensus upon this issue. The author, he says, If the person leaves the populated area of his town or village, what this means is that a person is intending to go on a journey which is 80 kilometers or more. That's the first step, right? He has the intention and he knows that the journey is going to be 80 kilometers or more. So when can the person avail himself of the rukhsa of this journey? Meaning that when can he break his fast? When can he join the prayers if he wishes to do so? And when can he shorten the prayers? All of this can only happen if he has left the populated area of his town or uh, village. So when he's past the uh, built up houses and he comes to an area whereby there's no houses or there are houses but they are not populated, that's the time when he can now start to uh, avail himself of the rukhsa of the journey from shortening the prayer, etc. So a question put to us by some of the scholars, they say, what if the villages are connected? So the rule that we've understood is that once you've passed your village, the built up area in the village, or the town, then you can start to avail yourself of the rukhsa. But what if the villages or the towns are connected one to the other, that as soon as you leave one village, you enter upon another village? What do we do in that situation? Question to yourselves, what would we do in that situation? Zakallah khair, Zakallah khair, may Allah give you good akhi. So basically the 80 kilometers criteria is that you cannot shorten on any journey which is less than 80 kilometers. So here we have a journey, we know it's going to be 80 kilometers, but we're saying that you cannot start availing yourself of this ruqsa. You can't start shortening the prayers unless you have left the built up areas of your village. Uh, so we established that as a principle that once you left the built up areas of your village, then you can start to shorten. OK, uh, but then a problem could arise that you leave one village and straight away you enter into another village, which is populated. So the ulama, they say here, basically, as soon as the issue is with regards to your village only. So why does this benefit us? Because if a person leaves one village and then he enters upon another village, he doesn't have to keep waiting until he passes by all of the villages because that may take more than 80 kilometers and that his journey may not be that long. And it means that he wouldn't be able to avail uh, the benefit of shortening the prayers. So what they say, it's only pertaining to your own village. And also with regards to today's scenario, whereby many of us, we live in cities which are huge. Uh, you know, of a distance more than 80 kilometers of area. So what it refers to is your locality, meaning your, um, your neighborhood. So if your neighborhood, uh, once you leave your particular neighborhood, then you can start to go ahead and, and join uh, your salah and to shorten your salah. Otherwise, it would mean that for you to go from one part of the city to the other part of the city, that may be two to 300 kilometers or even more than that. And you wouldn't be able to avail from the uh, ruqsa of shortening. So again, as a conclusion, the scholar uh, Al-Hajjawi, our author, he's saying that you can start to avail the shortening of the prayers or to break your fast or to join the prayers as soon as you have lived up the built up and populated areas of your village or town. And it doesn't matter whether there's another village directly after your village, okay, is what I am saying. The author says, أَوْ خِيَامَ قَوْمِهِ or if a person is a Bedouin and they live in uh, tented villages or tent towns which are built up of tents, that as soon as a person leaves the area uh, which is particular to his tribe uh, of tents, then he can go ahead and start to shorten his prayers, regardless of if there's another tribe right next to you that again has a, a, a row of tents. It doesn't matter about that. It matters that you have le left your own area of tents. So here's a mas'ala, another question or issue that uh, many people ask and speak about. The Hanbali scholars, they say that if one embarks upon a journey only to benefit from the rukhsa, then this is something which is impermissible, as mentioned by Sheikh Fahad al-Mutiri. What this means is some people, for example, in Ramadan, uh, they don't want to fast, okay? Or they, yeah, they don't want to fast, so they go on a journey to a particular land and they think that this is something which is smart and they're avoiding uh, the fasting of the long days in the country that they are in. But in fact, this is something which is not allowed because as the Hanbali scholar said that if your intention is to do this kind of act, that it's not a, then it's not sincerely taking the benefit that Allah Azawajal has given you. Because the ruqsa is only allowed for those who are sincerely going on a journey which has a clear objective. 
So if the journey doesn't have a clear objective and it's uh, something to do with playing around with the laws of Allah جل, then this is not permissible. So a person who goes on a journey only to take benefit from the ruqsa, then this is something which is not allowed. The next 11 points that the author is going to mention, it's going to be pertaining to the fact that a person uh, has to pray four raka instead of two raka, even though the person outwardly is considered to be a traveler or may be considered to be a traveler. So in the next 11 points the author is going to mention, the ruling of these points is that the person has to pray the four raka'ah and he's not allowed to join. So the first of them, he says, وَإِنْ أَحْرَمَا ثُمَّ سَافَرَا If a person makes takbirat al-ihram and then he travels, right? This person has to pray the complete four raka'ah and he's not allowed to pray two raka'ah even though after having made the takbirat al-ihram he could well be in his journey and left the uh, the town and the village that he was in. So an example of this is like, for example, if a person is on a boat which is docked uh, to the uh, at the border of his land. So once he makes the takbirat al-ihram, the boat leaves the dock and within the space of 10 minutes or so, it's miles away into the sea. So it's miles away from his land. So now this person is truly a traveler. However, because he started his prayer by the takbirat al-ihram while he was in his land or adjacent to his land, then this person is now not allowed to shorten. The person has to do the prayer in full in four. So this is the first scenario. The second scenario, أو في سفر ثم أقام Or the person is on a journey, so he starts his prayer on a journey, but by the time uh, within the space of half an hour or so, he's on a very fast transport like a train, he ends up reaching his uh, town. He ends up reaching his town or even uh, the place that he lives. So in this situation, the person also has to complete. So the person has to complete why? Is because though he started his journey as a traveler, now he's returned back to his residence. So the ulama, they say, Okay? That if the if the situation has that which is an allowance, the allowance was that the person was a traveller and he's allowed to shorten his prayer. And in the same situation, it has that which is hadr. Hadr is that he's not allowed to take the allowance, right? Because now he's returned back to his residence. So what takes precedence? They say غُلِبَ hadr. Okay, then the, the, the one which prevents, uh, it take, overrides the permission to shorten the prayer. So I'll simplify this again. So if a person, for example, he started his prayer whilst traveling, but then he ends up returning to his residence upon the transport that he is using before he finishes his prayer. So before he finishes Turaka, he returns to his locality where he lives. So herein, because now he's returned to being a resident and the, the act of suffer has been removed for him, then he has to complete his prayer as for. This is what the ulama mentioned with regards to this point. The author, he gives a third scenario, scenario. he says, ذَكَرَ صَلَاةَ حَدْرٍ فِي سَفَرٍ Or if this person is on a journey, okay, but however, he has a prayer to do, which he should have done whilst he's a resident. Now, in this situation, the person has to do the prayer as for. Why? Because they say, القضاء يحكي الأداء Because when you make up a prayer, you have to do it, okay, the way that you would have done praying normally. So this person, he's on a journey and he remembers that hang about yesterday when I prayed Dhuhr, I remember that I didn't make wudu. He clearly remembers he didn't make wudu. So that Dhuhr Salah, okay, was supposed to have been done while he was a resident. But now he's on a journey, he can't say to himself, okay, now I'm going to make up this prayer, which was from yesterday. I'm going to make up the Dhuhr prayer as a traveler, uh, and only do two. No, because he was supposed to have done it as a resident. So the qada yahki al adha The qada salah, the one which you have to make up, has to be done in the way which you would have done it if you were a resident. Therefore, it means that it has to be done up in full. And there's ijma' on this from Imam Ahmad and Ibn Mundar and others. Imam Ibn Mundar and others. طيب, another scenario, scenario number four. He says, أو أكسها, أو opposite to the scenario that we just mentioned, okay? The scenario that we just mentioned. So for example, a person upon reaching home realized that the prayer that he made on a journey, he had made a prayer on a journey, right? And he's reached home now. 
So the prayer that he made on the journey, he realized that he did it without wudu. So now that he's become a resident, okay, and has finished the traveling, he has to repeat that prayer as four. He has to do that prayer as four rakah because now the rulings of traveling have been removed for him. Therefore, he goes back to the asal, which is that he's a resident, even though he did the prayer originally whilst the traveler. But in this situation, he did it whilst he had forgotten to have made wudu. So when he comes home and he's going to repeat the prayer, he has to do it as four because now again, the rulings of traveling have been removed from him. طيب. قول ثاني in this masala, another opinion on this masala from the Hanbali scholars is that he prays two rakah, not four rakah. They say, due to the same rule, al-qada yahki al-ada, that when you make up a prayer, you do it in the way that you would have normally prayed it. So this person who was on a journey and he prayed two rakah on a journey, though now he's at home and he's realized that he prayed those two rakah without wudu, but by virtue of the fact that he prayed it on a journey, the second opinion says that no, again, he has to make it up based upon what he would have done whilst he was on the journey due to the rule that we've mentioned a few times now. In any case, the author, he says, this is the, uh, according to his opinion, the majority of the Hanbali scholars, they said that if a person uh, prayed whilst traveling to Raqqa, and then when he got home to his residence, he realized that his prayer wasn't done properly, he didn't have wudu, so in this situation, he has to make it up in the way that he would as a residence. This is the opinion of the author. The author, uh, situation number five, he says, بمقيم, Or a traveler, he's going to pray behind one who is in Muqeem. He's going to pray behind one who is a resident. So in this situation, though the person is a traveler, he has to pray complete. For why? Because Ibn Abbas in Sahih Muslim, when he was asked, why is it that the traveler, he prays two, but when he prays behind the resident, he prays four. Then Ibn Abbas in anhu, he said, Tilka sunnah, that is the sunnah of Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa This is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that when you're praying behind a muqeem person, a resident, then you have to pray four, even though you are a traveler. And also in the narrations we know in Sahih Bukhari and other places, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that very the Imam has been made to be followed. Okay, so in this situation, the author is saying that if you pray behind somebody who is a resident, even though you are traveling, then you have to pray full. Ibn Taymiyyah he has another opinion. He says that if the person plays, prays less than a rak'ah for whatever reason behind the muqim, then in this situation he is allowed to complete as a traveler. So if he prays less than one rak'ah behind the resident. He's allowed to complete his salah as a traveler, meaning only two raka'at mentioned by Sheikh Sheikh Fahd al Mutiri. A mas'ala which is very similar to what we're discussing, and sorry to mention so many details, it's just that the topics are so important and it's good to have a basic understanding of them. Uh, here's a mas'ala if the Imam is a musafir and he makes, makes is, istikhlaf. And as we mentioned before, what istikhlaf means is that the Imam, when he's leading, he knows, like for example, he's about to break his wudu. So he brings in a person from behind him to carry on the salah. So here, the Imam is a musafir and he missed istikhlaf, right, for a valid reason. And the one he brings from behind him is a muqim, is a resident. So in this situation, the travelers behind him, though the Imam was a traveler, they have to complete the salah as four. Why? Because the imam now, the one that has been brought to them now, is a muqim. So they have to pray what the muqim is praying, and that is that he's going to pray for raka'at. And also the opposite of this scenario, which is that if the imam is a muqim, the imam is a resident, okay? The first situation we gave, the imam was a traveler. The imam is a resident, he's muqim, and he makes, makes istikhlaf with the musafir. He brings in his position, uh, to carry on the salah, one who is a traveler. So now the uh, congregation has to complete also as full. Why? Because they're completing that which the Muqim Imam started with. Okay, they're completing that which the uh, uh, Muqim Imam started with. Al istidamatu aqwa min al-ibtida. The author he says, as uh, scenario number six, he says, أو بمن يشك فيه and in this situation, uh, the person will again have to pray for all of these situations that we're mentioning. The person has to complete as for even though he's a traveler. He says, 
if the Imam is not known to the traveller, whether this Imam that I'm praying behind, is he a traveller or is he a resident? Is he a Muqim? So the traveller is doubtful, okay, whether this person is a, a traveller or not. So in this situation, the person, the traveller has to pray full. He has to pray full. So the ulama, they say generally in this situation, if, you, if you're traveling and you come upon an imam, okay, the jama'ah is taking place, but you're not sure is the person a traveler or not. Should I pray two? Should I pray four? They say what you have to do, you have to look for qara'in. A qarina is an external evidence. So for example, if you're in the airport, first and foremost, that would make you think that the person that you're praying behind is likely to be a traveler, right? So you would only pray two. Uh, you would look and uh, to see if there's any traveling bags, etc. But if you're in the airport and you come to realize that this person uh, is a traveler, is a muqim, then you would have to pray behind that person for sure as a muqim. And also, if like the author is saying, you are in doubt, you're not sure whether the person is a traveler or a muqim, then you would have to pray for because this is known as istishab al-asl. Istishab al-asl. Al-asl that to uh, continue with the original state of affairs, which is that in general, everybody is a muqim unless the proof is given that he's a traveler. So the author is saying with regards to one that you are, have doubt in, with regards to is he a muqim or is he a traveler as an imam, then unless you have external evidence, unless you have qara'in or qarina, then you have to pray as four. Situation number seven, he says, أَوْ أَحْرَمَا بِصُرَاتٍ يَلْزَمُهُ إِتْمَامُهَا فَفَسَدَتْ وَعَعَادَهَا Or, the traveller, he makes taqbirat al-ihram in a salah, okay, which he should pray uh, as for, meaning that he's praying behind one who is a muqeem. So, the traveller, he's praying behind one who is a muqeem, but then he breaks his wudu. So now when he goes to make wudu and he comes back to complete his prayer, the salah has finished. The muqeem has finished the salah. The resident imam has finished the salah. So what does this person do in this situation? Does he pray now as a traveler or does he pray as uh, for as a muqeem? The Hanbali scholars and our author, they say that the person completes uh, four raka'at. Why? Because he started the prayer behind an imam with the intention of praying four raka'at. So even though he break, broke his wudu, went away, made his wudu, came back, the congregation had finished and he has to start again from the beginning. This doesn't then allow him to pray only two raka'ah. In this situation, he has to pray four raka'ah. Tayyip. A mas'ala, a situation similar to this, not mentioned by the author, but extra detail. One is praying behind a resident imam, right? In the middle of the salah, he realizes that hang about, I didn't even make wudu. I didn't have wudu from the beginning of the salah. So he goes to make wudu, he comes back and he finds that the resident imam has finished all four raka'at and now the, imam, the traveler has to repeat the salah. So what does the traveler do? Does he pray as two raka'at or does he pray as four raka'at? The ulama, they say in this situation, it's different to the previous situation. In this situation, he would pray two raka'at. Why would he pray only two raka'at in this situation? Question to yourselves. As they say, As they say, So in reality, his salah wasn't established in a legal manner. So therefore, the salah wasn't established in a legal manner because he didn't have wudu in the first place. So in this situation, he's allowed to pray two raka'at. Whereas in the situation before that we're describing, he was praying behind the imam and his wudu broke in the middle of the salah. That's why when he came back, he had to pray four raka'at. Jazakallah khair. طيب, situations number eight and nine, the author he mentions, أولم ينوي القصر إن دأحرامها. The first of the situation number eight, he says that uh, it could be that a situation that a person didn't have the intention, uh, for whatever reason, at the time of takbirat al-hiram to make qasr. So if a person didn't make the intention, maybe he forgot, then this person has to pray four rakat. Okay, أو شك في نيتي, or he has doubt. And whether did I make the intention or did I not make the intention, then even by based upon doubt, then he has to complete four raka'at. Why is it that if he's in a situation of doubt, if he made the intention or not, does he have to pray four raka'at? Question to yourselves. That's very close. Jazakallah khair, may Allah give you good. What they mean here, the ulama, they say, is because uh, the, the yaqeen, the yaqeen in his niyyah is adum niyyah, is the absence of the niyyah. 
So in a situa situation like this, you can't do an act of worship where you are doubtful based upon your intention. So what you do is you remove that intention altogether and you say that the yaqeen is that I did not make the intention. Therefore, I have to pray for rak'at. That is what the ulama explain in this mas'ala. So just a quick recap, in this situation 8 and 9, the author, he says, if, you're, if the person is in a situation where he forgot to make the niyyah for qasr, or he's in doubt, did he make the niyyah for qasr or not, then in both of these situations, he prays complete, he prays for raka'at. The second riwayah in the madhab on this is that the person doesn't have to make an intention for shortening, because by virtue of the fact that he's on a journey which is 80 kilometers or more, then he is allowed to shorten his prayers whether he made the intention or he didn't make the intention in the beginning. This is a second opinion uh, on the mas'ala and this was held by Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala and Shaykh Uthaymeen rahimahullah ta'ala as well as the Hanafi scholars and the Maliki scholars. طيب, the tenth situation, he says the author, may Allah have mercy upon him, أو نوى إقامة أكثر من أربعة أيام If a person is intending that when he reaches his residence so he reaches his destination from the journey, he's going to stay for more than four days. So if this is the situation, then the person who reaches the destination with the intention to stay for more than four days, as soon as he reaches, he's not allowed to shorten the prayers or join the prayers, okay? He can't take the rukhas of being a traveler. Why? Because as previously we mentioned before, that Ibn Abbas, he said that the Prophet ﷺ stayed in Mecca for four days, shortening. And so based upon this narration, they say anything beyond four days or is not allowed to shorten uh, with. So again, the author is saying, and the majority of the scholars in all of the madhahib, uh, they say that the person who is intending for more than four days to stay is not allowed to shorten. The last of them, the last of these situations, he says, or a person who's like a sailor or a captain of a ship, okay? He has his family with him on a ship and he's not intending to stay in any particular land. Then this person is not uh, allowed to take the ruqsa of, um, of shortening, okay? He's not allowed to take the ruqsa of being on a, on a journey. Why? Because he has with him his family, his house is on the ship and he's not taking any qama, he's not taking residence in any particular land. He's always traveling on his boat. So they, they say that this person is as though he's a resident because he has his family with him, he has his house with him. Okay, so he resembles the muqim from this aspect and he's not allowed to shorten. A second opinion held by Ibn Qudam, ta'ala, he says that the person is allowed to shorten because he falls under the general heading, Umuman, the general heading of being a traveler if he travels on journeys more than 80 kilometers, etc. A mas'ala uh, to mention that if a person, the Hanbali scholars, they say that if a person is in a land, he's traveled to a land, and the land, the distance was more than 80 kilometers. However, in that land, he's not intending to be a resident, but he has his wife there, a second wife maybe, or he's, he has his wife living in that resident. Then here, he's not allowed to shorten uh, the prayers because of the fact that he has uh, another house or another family in, in that land. Therefore, he's not allowed to shorten there in Allah's Allah's best. So going back to the point that we started with in this, uh, in the new section here, the author in the last point, the author he said that if a person is traveling to a land with the intention to stay there for four days or more, then the person is not allowed to travel, not allowed to shorten the prayers. He then says, related to this point, what in kana lahu tariqatan. No, that comes. Yeah, that comes in the second section pertaining to joining. Sorry. So the author, he says, If a person is on a journey and in front of him, he has two pathways, he has two choices, two paths that he can take. One of them is not going to reach 80 kilometers or more, but the other one is going to reach more than 80 kilometers. And then he takes the path, which is 80 kilometers. The author, he says that he's allowed to shorten. So this sounds very strange. Why is this? Why did he mention this? Because many of the ulama, they said that if a person takes a path or takes a route only for the reason to be able to shorten, meaning that he has two choices, he could take either route. <coughs> One route is not 80 kilometers or more. However, the second route is 80 kilometers or more. 
So the person chooses to take the longer route for the sole reason of wanting to be able to benefit from the ruksa. Our author is saying it's allowed for him to do that. And the reason he mentioned this is because there are other uh, scholars that say it's not allowed. So the author mentioned it to show that according to him and the humbly scholars, it is allowed. And the second part of this masala, they say, Another issue that the author mentioned here in this sentence, he says that if a person has a prayer that he should have prayed whilst he was on a journey. Now he doesn't remember this until he's on a second journey. Then the person is allowed again to shorten the prayer. So as an explanation, the ulama, they say a person is on a journey and on this journey, he uh, prayed salah, for example, to raka. And he's come home and now he's gone on a second journey. So when he's on that second journey, he realizes that the first journey that I was on, the asr prayer that I prayed, I prayed it without wudu. So now he's on a second journey. He's allowed once again to pray the other journey that he prayed again as asr because again, he's a musafir. Okay. So they say that the action occurred while he was on the journey. Therefore, he's allowed again to do it uh, as, um, as a musafir because now again, He's a musafir on a second journey. So to summarize this point again very quickly, that a person is on a journey, he prays two raka'ah, when he gets home, and then he starts another journey. On the second journey, he realizes that on the first journey, the prayer that I prayed is two raka'ah, I prayed without wudu. So now, by virtue of the fact that he's on a second journey, he's allowed to make up that salah as two raka'ah on the second journey. طيب, another mas'ala which is very important, Sheikh Khalid Mushayqi mentions, he says that if one is on a journey, okay, and the journey is going to be 80 kilometers or more, but midway through the journey, he prays his salawat, he prays dhuhr and asr, right? He, he joins them and he prays them in two raka and two raka. So midway on this journey, he gets a call from home and he needs to return home. He returns home and he gets home in the time of asr. So he prayed asr and dhuhr in the time of dhuhr whilst he was on a journey. They say that now that he's returned as being a resident, even though it's still time for Asr, he doesn't have to pray Asr because he already prayed it legally whilst he was on the journey, even though he didn't complete the journey. Because he had the intention to be on the journey and the journey was more than 80 kilometers. And now something came upon him, which is out of his control. He didn't intend. He was called back home due to some emergency or something. He returns and the time of Asr is still there. He doesn't have to pray Asr because he prayed it on the journey and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Sheikh Khalid Mushayqi mentions another mas'ala. He said that if one has prayed on a journey, okay, a particular salah, like Asr, for example, he prayed to Raqqa, and now he reaches his residence, and the time, the Adhan of Asr has just been made. So he prayed his Asr with Dhuhr whilst on the journey. Now he's returned to his residence, and the time of Asr has just come in, the Adhan has been made. He doesn't have to pray. With the, uh, with the congregations as he already prayed whilst he was on journey. And Allah knows best. طيب, the last mas'ala, the author, he says, حبسا ولم ينوي إقامة. Now, this was the mas'ala I was looking for before where I got confused. He says, وَإِنْ حُبِسَ وَلَمْ ينوي إقامة. So before, a few sentences ago, Imam Al-Hajjab, he said, a person who's a traveler, if he intends to stay in a land for more than four days, he's not allowed to shorten. Now he mentions another mas'ala pertaining to that. He says, So if a person is withheld for whatever reason, okay, in a particular land, and he didn't intend to stay there for more than four days, okay? So for example, a person enters upon a land and then there's a huge storm, and this huge storm is preventing him from leaving uh, before four days is complete. He didn't intend to stay in the land for more than four days. Okay, like it happened to Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, as mentioned by Imam Abd al-Razak in his Musannaf, and mentioned by Imam al-Bayhaqi and al-Kubra. Okay, these two great Imams, they collect this author from Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, who said, Urtuj alayna thalj, wa nahnu bi'azabajan, sitata ashur min ghazat. Okay, wa kunna nusalli raqa'atayn. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, we were in Azerbaijan, uh, making uh, battles and we were in that land for six months because the ice had surrounded us I mean the snow and the blizzards were so strong we couldn't leave the land so we were there for six months 
and we would each time pray shortened salah as a traveler even though they stayed for more than four months for more than four days why why did they continue shortening even though they stayed for more than four days because they were they were prevented okay it wasn't of their own choice they were prevented from leaving that land therefore if somebody is in a land and he's prevented from leaving okay he's unjustly imprisoned or something of the nature like that then he's allowed to continue to shorten his prayers as long as he is in that land because he doesn't intend of his own choice and volition to stay there for more than four days. The author he says, Or he's in the land, okay, and he's not intending to be there for more than four days. However, in this situation, he doesn't know how long it's going to take him to fulfill his need. So a person goes to a land, he has an operation that he needs to do in that land. He goes there, he's not sure, is it going to take me more than four days or is it going to take me less than four days? So he hasn't made the niyyah to be there more than more than four days. If he finishes in one day, he will leave. If he finishes in three days, he will leave. However, it may take him more than four days, but not due to his own intention, right? So in this situation also, a person can shorten as long as, as he needs to because he hasn't made the intention to be there for more than four days. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Anything which was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and Shaytan. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to give us clarity and understanding and to give us fiqh and make us from those who worship Him based upon the Quran and Sunnah and understanding of the Salaf. Ameen. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alayhi wa sallam. If you have any questions, then feel free. And the second part of this topic, which is the joining part, uh, we will take next week if Allah gives us the tawfiq, inshaAllah. If you have any questions, then feel free, inshaAllah.